Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland. Live on the phone with me today, I have Liz Funk in upstate New York. Liz is a writer, speaker, and coach. She's written about careers, mental health and wellness for USA Today, The Washington Post, Fast Company, and The Economist. She's also the founder of Befriend Your Glowing OCD Brain, a speaking and coaching business that raises awareness about OCD and helps people recover and create lives of their own design. Liz, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Well, it's so good to chat with you. We were just talking about the fact that you live in the same place where I went to college. So it's it's really nice to talk to someone who's in upstate New York. You know, it's funny. I feel like when you're at a place where you are doing what you you love and you're focused on doing the next right thing, synchronicities pop up left and right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. So, as much as I was delighted to find out that you went to RPI and had some special years here, I wasn't surprised. Because <laughs> um, you, you have these interesting intersections with people. The more you branch out and get out of your comfort zone and start conversations with interesting people. I totally agree. And I think this particular topic is a really important one. And I'm excited to kind of dive into it and get your perspective on sort of OCD and and tips, you know, if we have OCD or if we work with someone who has OCD, kind of how, you know, how we can tackle it. But I think before we jump into the questions, can you help us to to understand if, if we're not familiar, what is OCD and what are the different kind of categories of OCD behavior? Like what, help me to understand what it looks like. Of course. Um, It's interesting. In our culture, we very commonly use OCD as an adjective for neurotic or particular or uptight. You'll hear people say, you know, I'm so OCD about X. And Khloe Kardashian actually has this disgraceful YouTube series called Khloe CD, where Mm -hmm. she shows us how she organizes her closet with her shoes. Um color-coordinated and organized by brands. And when people think of OCD, they think of this outwardly visible compulsion that people have to create order in their life with Mm -hmm. symmetry and with color coordination and with everything being just so. And that outward visibility makes up about half of OCD cases. Okay. For the other half of people who have OCD, it's pretty much invisible to everyone except the person experiencing it. Okay. Um, It's called pure obsession, and it's where you get a thought in your head and you can't get it out, so you go through elaborate thinking rituals, either trying to disprove the thought or trying to wash the thought away or trying to disprove the thought and then bat it away every time it comes back again. Mm, Okay. And what's funny is that, you know, it can sound like pure old anxiety when you describe it to someone, but it's the repetitiveness, the intrusiveness, and the irrational nature of the thoughts that really makes it OCD. So is it something, people who live with OCD, is it something that they're kind of working through every day? Is, are the, the thoughts are coming back every day? What's challenging and also a gift about OCD is uh-huh. that you don't recover from it okay. the way that you might recover 100% from a cold or the flu or what have you. Sure. Um, your OCD doesn't really get better. You get better. You develop skills to manage it and have more self-mastery over your thoughts and your behaviors. Okay. And it's sort of a a self-reinforcing cycle in that the more you practice good behaviors and, you know, the right responses to your thoughts, the less noticeable your thoughts are. Okay. So I guess it does it take 
a certain level of sort of um, self-awareness to be able to kind of reach that state? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're, on, you're in your head for better and for worse. Okay. So um, I think a good example is, like, I was at the grocery store in January, and I was in the freezer aisle, and I was looking to buy gluten-free waffles mm-hmm. because I'm allergic to gluten. And I suddenly realized, like, oh, like, I have just had this really violent thought in my head, but I was not paying attention to it at all. It was just, you know, kind of a, a sideshow playing while I was going about what I wanted to be doing. Mm-hmm. And even though it sounds grim, that's a best-case scenario for someone living with a relatively severe case of OCD, that you can be happy and healthy and high-functioning mm-hmm. and just have these really bizarre thoughts that kind of go on in your peripheral vision, and you, you learn how to ignore them. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So in terms of sort of the workplace, for those of us who may have OCD, how does having it interfere with your coworker relationships or with kind of the way that you're functioning at work? You know, I was giving this a lot of thought after we chatted over email and we're discussing this topic. And I think this really all depends on your workplace culture. Mm. If you work somewhere that is, transparent and they walk the walk and people are very open to candid discussions about what's going on in their lives and you know what it's like to be them I think it's okay to have um, a carefully crafted discussion with your boss and with your coworkers about having your CD and you can create dialogue about what your life is like and how you see things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. I think what people need to be wary of is saying, like, I have OCD, and then having one of your coworkers say, "Um, my pencil case is so organized, or what have you. Mm. You know, my pen jar is only this kind of pen, and they have to space that way. And then you can feel frustrated because you think... You know, I have to quadruple check my emails for typos after I send them. Or mm-hmm. I deal with this uncertainty that my email might have typos in them, and I have to be okay with that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I think when people are talking with their coworkers or their manager about having OCD, it's best to get in front of the conversation and explain what your experience is before other people kind of chime in with their experience of maybe being anxious or maybe liking things to be just so, Mm -hmm. but not having OCD. Okay. So it sounds like there may be some situations where it's a positive thing to disclose and other times when maybe you don't want to. Is that kind of true? Absolutely. Okay. Um, that, that's really keen of you to, to notice that. There are definitely instances where OCD can get in the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I've personally experienced, you know, having an intrusive thought that totally, you know, gets in the way of what I want to be doing that day. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there are untold number of benefits of having this increased level of self-awareness and self-mastery that's a requirement if you want to thrive despite having OCD. Mm -hmm. And um, there are two really important components of that. One of it is that um, you need to be able to choose what you focus on. Okay. Um, uh, To just use a random example, like you can have this thought that like, the sole of your shoe feels kind of bumpy and it's driving you nuts. And there's nothing wrong with your shoe, but it just feels like you're walking on uneven turf. Mm -hmm. Like that's something that people with OCD experience sometimes. And um, you have to learn to accept the fact that your shoes don't feel quite right, Mm -hmm. but you're going to do whatever you need to do that day. And you have all the skills and you know, all of the 
willpower that you need. It's just a matter of being able to change your focus, mm-hmm. being able to choose what you focus on. So you can say like, yeah, my shoes feel screwy, but I really want to get back to this client, or I'm so excited about writing this proposal. I'm going to do it with my bumpy sold shoes. Right. Um, so that's one thing. Uh-huh. And then the other major component of having OCD that I think can be very beneficial and I think everyone can capitalize on is getting comfortable with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're in the like throes of trying to overcome OCD, your main task is getting okay with the idea that you don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, you could have this phobia of, like, maybe I left a candle burning or maybe I left the stove on. And you have to say to yourself, okay, like, maybe I did leave the stove burner on. Like, that would suck if it started a fire, but I'm not going to waste time going back into the house and checking. I'm going to keep living my life even though I feel uncertain. Mm-hmm. And um, that can be applied for pretty much any problem or type of mental discomfort that a human being can have. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm uncomfortable with this uncertainty, but I don't want to waste time or mental energy checking to make sure that it won't happen or doing things to try to manipulate this outcome. Um, You know, if you can get comfortable with uncertainty and the idea that we don't fully know what's going to happen in our lives, and it's really a waste of time to try to make things happen just so, that's just shy of a superpower. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's that's good advice even, you know, for those listeners who might not have OCD. It's good advice just in general, uh, you know, being okay with uncertainty. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, part of what got me really passionate about this topic, Mm -hmm. outside of the fact that I have a raging case of OCD, (laughs) is that um, I, and I'm very open about it, I'm happy to talk about it Mm -hmm. later, Um, but in Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath, Mm -hmm. he talks about this staggering percentage of entrepreneurs that have learning disorders. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what the group was that he based this information on. It might have been like the Inc. 5000 or maybe a similar fortune list. Mm -hmm. But his argument was that up to 70% of these high-achieving entrepreneurs had some form of learning disorder and as many as as half of them had dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And dyslexia and their ability to work around it and think on their feet and negotiate when they needed to and sort of pivot around this obstacle made them really, really successful in business. Mm -hmm. And um, I distinctly remember the day that I was listening to uh, this book on audiobook while I was cooking in my kitchen in Brooklyn and thinking, okay, like if the movie producer Brian Grazer and the mega... CEO Richard Branson could figure out ways to get around having dyslexia and leverage that to their enormous professional and financial benefit, there must be a way for people with OCD to do the same. Mm -hmm. And what I really think is that it's this comfort with uncertainty that you have to integrate into every part of your life where you encounter some kind of obsession or ritual that you have to avoid, Mm -hmm. it really makes us a strangely wrapped gift. Absolutely. Well, so, you know, first of all, I love uh, the book that you mentioned by Malcolm Gladwell. I think there might have been an example along the lines that you're mentioning of, uh, I think it was a lawyer who... I can't remember if he couldn't read for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? <laughs> and yeah, but he had crippling dyslexia. Mm-hmm. Um, and he couldn't, I think it was that it was to the extent that his reading comprehension was so low that um, he really couldn't memorize 
the facts of the cases before he went into the courtroom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Something to that effect. Yeah, and I think he because he was weak in one area, he overcompensated in other areas. And I think it was his verbal skills were, like his listening skills were very, very sharp. Something to that effect. And he could win cases uh, better than other lawyers because he saw things differently than they did because of the way that he learns. Um, So it was really interesting. And you're kind of leading into sort of my next question, which is, you know, are there advantages to having OCD and and what are those advantages? And I think we're kind of alluding to it here, but I'd love to kind of get your perspective. It's overall a comfort with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. It's really being okay with the idea, I don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. I don't know what next month is going to look like. But life is always right now, so I'm going to do the best I can in this moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to let my energy reserves be depleted by trying to control things or by trying to make things happen a certain way that will make me feel more comfortable. Right, right. That Um, makes sense. In the beginning, you feel horribly raw, but... In time, you get comfortable with the idea that we don't know what's going to happen to us. And the best we can do is to live our lives to the fullest and support other people and teach other people that they don't need to try to control everything to feel comfortable or to feel happy. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, so what if we're kind of on the other side of this coin? Uh, what if we are someone who does not have OCD, but is working with, uh, you know, has a coworker that has OCD? Do you have any tips for us in terms of how to best interact with that coworker or things that we might do to, you know, promote a positive relationship? That's a great question. Um, what's interesting about it is um, people with untreated OCD tend to be really challenging managers if their OCD manifests itself at work. Mm -hmm. And I think a really excellent example is Steve Jobs. Okay. Um, He's been diagnosed with OCD from afar by a number of people who have talked about how it seems that he's uncomfortable with a number of commonplace things and that he had this compulsion to design and fix products, really, until the the day he died. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember reading an article. I I don't remember where it was. Um, If if I can find it, I'll email it to you, and maybe we can put it in the show notes. Yeah, sure. Um, But he had ripped off his oxygen mask off his face when he was in the hospital because he was like, this is is poorly designed. I don't want to wear this. Oh, wow. Yeah, he just had this compulsion to improve everything wherever he was. And granted, this gave us beautiful phones and tablets, but we know that he was a menace to work for because mm-hmm. he was controlling and he was he was obsessed with typos. And I believe he, like, checked multiple times for typos in anything that was going out underneath like his name, Mm -hmm. but that he was pretty preoccupied with whether or not there were typos in any formal communications that Apple Inc. released. That's interesting. Um, And as you and I both know, like productive, high-functioning CEOs don't get that micro. Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's a good example, and it's, um, you know, it's like you wonder whether or not it was... A good thing because the company did so well so um it's it's kind of i guess there are pros and cons there definitely i mean he was a genius and he was an innovator and to a certain extent i think he's really changed the way that we talk about careers mm-hmm. um this generation of young people are more entrepreneurial and more focused on like a self-propelled career trajectory than ever before. True. Mm -hmm. And I really do wonder how much of it can be traced back to Steve Jobs and his 2005 Stanford University commencement address that we all 
mm-hmm. reference and love that you know, you have to do what makes you happy and you have to do what you're passionate about. You have to be willing to risk failure. Mm-hmm. And it's much easier to do those things when you're in a nonlinear career path. Right, right. No, that's true. That's very, very true. But personally, if he was my manager, I would probably cry in the bathroom every <laughs> single day and like quit after three months. I suspect that may have happened. <laughs> Oh, I think it happened all the time. <laughs> right, right. I think it, I read his uh, biography by Walter Isaacson, and his middle daughter, I think her name was Maeve, she was afraid of him because he was so mean, and he only respected people who could stand up to him or who would argue back with him. And his middle daughter was shy and reserved and a little bit introverted. And they didn't get along because she didn't know how to interact with her compulsive, zany dad. Wow, that's interesting. I I had no idea. Oh, I highly recommend the Walter Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs. It's narrated by an actor with a really wonderful, like, velvety voice. Mm -hmm. So if you get it on audiobook from Audible or on CDs from your library, library... It's really like chocolate for your ears. Oh, nice. (laughs) That's great. I think it's 26 hours and it just, it flies by. Oh, wow. That's quite long. (laughs) That's, That's quite a commitment. Well, so in addition to speaking about OCD, another topic that you really talk about is stress reduction. And I'd love to kind of get your perspective first. I mean, I know a lot of us who are very driven in our careers, we tend to deal with stress all the time. From your perspective, why is it important that we focus on stress reduction? So the little joke that I like to make is we take massive action when our phones get to 2%, but we frequently let ourselves get to 2%. Mm-hmm. So I think the best thing that people can do for themselves is picture having like a cell phone battery next to their head and make a process of checking in with yourself and saying, what's my charge right now? Mm-hmm. So if it's like 11, 15 a.m. and you just got out of a meeting and you didn't have anything to contribute and your presence was kind of superfluous, like, your charge might already be down to 35%. Mm-hmm. So you have to think about what things you can proactively do to feel more energized and more motivated and more in control of your day. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if it's 1 p.m. and you just had coffee and you're, like, banging emails out on your laptop your charge is probably in like the 80 to 90 range. Mm -hmm. And maybe right now isn't the best time to take your lunch break because Mm -hmm. you're pretty in the zone, even though it's like a traditional hour to step out of the office and be a little draggy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So again, Angela, it goes back to what you mentioned before, that it's all about this self-awareness. It's about understanding how you do your best work and how you feel as you're doing it. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Well, what kinds of things, I mean, I think this is pretty common knowledge, but just high level, what are some of the things that happen if we don't pay attention to our stress? I mean, what are the consequences? Um, You find yourself pulling out your eyebrow hair when you're not thinking about it, and you find you're drinking way more coffee than a person should be, and the local barista at Starbucks knows your boyfriend's name. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, when we're stressed, there's a huge range of things that can happen. I think the most pernicious is when you wake up at three in the morning and it's a little bit light out, but it's sure as shit, not time to get up. Mm -hmm. And you're like, why am I wide awake? Mm -hmm. Like my eyes are peeled open. Right. Mm -hmm. And our our brains are just racing. We're ready to start thinking for the day, and we're ready to start overcoming hurdles. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because we're in this kind of defensive mindset that our day is just a series of obstacles to overcome. And as soon as our eyes flap open, we're in that mode. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But I think with more self-awareness, like if you're able to leave that really draining meeting and say like, like, okay, that was not an awesome use of time and I was very frustrated that I was pulled in there and, you know, my boss didn't encourage me to contribute, but also I couldn't really contribute. Mm -hmm. You can take your stress level down from like a 94 to like, you know, a big Lebowski level of like 18. Right. <laughs> I didn't have to be there. I don't care. Like, we can take these opportunities when we would normally get really frustrated and just be like, all right, this is downtime for my brain. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, so speaking of downtime for the brain, in, you know, when you're talking to groups and you're advising them on how to reduce stress, what are some of the tips that you give, you know? What are the tips that you have for us on reducing our stress? The number one thing is self-care. I think it's really, really important to have an understanding of how you can best soothe yourself and comfort yourself in healthy ways in the time that you have allotted. So what I recommend everybody do is make like a spreadsheet of if I have 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or 40 minutes. What are things that I can do in each of these time slots to really recharge my batteries and make myself feel comfortable? Mm -hmm. um, so if it's 10 minutes, it could be just, you know, watching a couple of your favorite YouTube videos that make you laugh every time. If it's 30 minutes, it could be calling your sister or catching up with your mom or maybe, you know, reading a full chapter from you know, the new sexy nonfiction book. Mm -hmm. um, if it's 40 minutes, it could be going to the gym. Um, it could be getting Chipotle and avoiding the gym at all costs. Um, it's about really having this higher level of self-knowledge about how can I juice my batteries as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so for me personally, I know if I only have a couple of minutes, I love watching SNL clips mm -hmm. of the actors breaking character. I think it's the funniest thing when they crack themselves up. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And if I have 20 minutes, I'll do my nails. Um, if I have 30 minutes, I'll mop my apartment. And if I have 40 minutes, I'll go for a walk and either listen to an hour long podcast or um, Sometimes I just try to be along with my thoughts and not listen to music, and that feels challenging and refreshing in equal measure. Yeah, I was going to say that is kind of challenging sometimes. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I really like your suggestion, though, of having a list. I could see having maybe having that list in your phone even where you have the, I've got five minutes, ten minutes, thirty minutes, an hour, because I think a lot of times when we do have time to take a little break, you're kind of left thinking, oh, gosh, now what am I going to do with my time? And the time may just slip by. Absolutely, yeah. I think for a lot of people, like, you walk around kind of shaking out your wrist, like, ah, I've done something. What do I do? Mm -hmm. No, um, exactly. And my younger sister is one of the most high-functioning people I've ever met. And she has this thing that she says that, like, there's nothing worse been realizing that you've procrastinated away your precious downtime. Yes. So how can you figure out how to make it really juicy and really valuable? Yes. I was just talking with someone about that yesterday. It's like there's got to be like a balance between losing the time versus overscheduling the time. You know, when you have a little downtime, you also don't want to overschedule yourself so that it's not relaxing. So it's like finding that sort of in between that is actually really helpful. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's nothing more stressful than a Sunday where you're like, I'm going to go to the gym, and then I'm going to go to brunch, and then I'm going to meet a friend at Barnes & Noble, and then I'm going to meet a different friend, and we're going to go for a walk, and then I'm going to watch Netflix with my significant other. Like, mm -hmm. that's not relaxing. That's packing as much as you can into your ill-named leisure time. Right, right. And it almost reminds me a bit sometimes of when we go on vacation and we are overbooked on our vacation and we come home feeling like we need a vacation from the vacation. 
Absolutely. Like two days of recovery from your vacation. And so you've just run a marathon. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so the other thing that um, ties in to sort of stress and OCD is anxiety. And I know this is another area that you focus on. Can you talk to us a little bit about how anxiety ties into stress and OCD and what we might do to manage that anxiety? Absolutely, yeah. So anxiety gets us frozen. It makes us think pretty much exclusively in what if statements. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this future outcome presents a problem? Mm -hmm. And the funny thing about anxiety is frequently we think we're protecting ourselves by overthinking or by imagining the future situations that we'll need to be on guard before, Mm -hmm. whereas frequently none of those things ever happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know about you, but when I think about it, of all the things I've ever worried about, I think two of them became a problem. (laughs) That's true. We do probably tend to worry about more things than than we need to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for quote-unquote normal people who don't have OCD, my question would be, of all the things you've ever worried about, has any of them ever become a problem? Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people, like probably a sizable hunk, the answer is no. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of managing anxiety on a micro level, I think it's, again, really important to have some self-care strategies, mm-hmm. like, at your ready. So these are things that you've practiced when you're not anxious. Mm-hmm. It's sort of almost in a fire drill sense. So when you are anxious, you reflexively know what to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you feel like, oh, my God, I'm about to hop out of my skin or, you know, if you're really in the moment, like, I'm at work and I have to give this presentation in five minutes, what are some things that you can do to calm yourself down and get back into feeling like, okay, you know, I can do whatever it is that's put in front of me. And I'm a powerful person, and I'm in touch with my abilities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, So quick fix, I think, would be doing some Amy Cuddy-style power posing. Okay. She had that uh, very popular TED Talk about how when you stand in an X, Mm -hmm. or when you stand like Superwoman and have your hands at your hips and your feet spread apart, Mm -hmm. you cue chemical changes in your brain where your brain assumes, like, oh, because I'm standing big, I'm powerful. Mm -hmm. Um, And that can be a pretty immediate and very noticeable fix. Um, In terms of more personalized suggestions, I mean, you can have a quote board on Pinterest Mm -hmm. that you go to when you need a boost. Yeah. Um, You can wear, like, your favorite perfume and just sniff your wrist and be like, oh, yeah, I've got this. Like, Mm -hmm. whatever it takes for you to feel like the best version of you. Absolutely. Well, you know, and some people talk about it in terms of sort of mindfulness. Is that something that you kind of, that you talk about or think about in terms of sort of managing stress and anxiety? I'll be totally honest with you. I'm just a very high-strung person, and I find mindfulness really challenging and frustrating and difficult. Yeah, sure. (laughs) <laughs> and when I speak at colleges, um, I probably talk at about 10 colleges every semester about mm-hmm. how high-achieving young women can make burnout prevention part of their lifestyles and get comfortable making time for themselves and being alone with their thoughts so mm-hmm. they can recharge. Right. I tell them, like, listen, everyone says meditation is the best thing you can do for yourself. I personally do not do it. I feel as though I cannot do it. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. Download Headspace and give it a try. Oh, is that an Um, app? Yeah, Headspace is this really cool app. They give you, I think, seven or ten days free Mm -hmm. to try listening to these ten-minute meditations that Mm -hmm. are really soothing and calming. Um, But, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest about my shortcomings. Like, when I sit down and finally have some 
stillness at the end of the day. Like, that's when I noticed, like, oh, my knee's itchy. Like, oh, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I need sure. to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Like, I, I don't find meditation soothing at all. I actually find it very triggering for anxiety. Yeah, yeah. I could see that. Well, so when you travel around, you you were saying you talk to, like, 10 or so colleges per semester. Do the students get to ask you questions at all? They do, yeah. Are there is there, like, a theme that you're noticing of, like, the their biggest kind of concerns that they're facing? Yeah, yeah. Um, there are two that I've seen pretty much at every campus or every other campus that I've spoken at. Mm-hmm. One of them is when I have downtime, whether it's during a break in the day or at the end of the day, I freak out. Mm-hmm. I'm so used to going and going and doing and doing that I have no idea what to do with myself when I don't have something concrete in front of me. Mm-hmm. And I think an issue that a lot of young women encounter is that they'll take a task on their to-do list and they'll blow it up into being much more time-consuming than it needs to be so they can have that time accounted for and so they have some comfort. Like, oh, I was productive at pretty much every waking moment today. Mm -hmm. Like, I can conk out and feel accomplished. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Whereas I think young women really need to get comfortable with some amount of stillness so they can relax and recharge. Absolutely. I mean, as I said, um, I don't meditate, but I do read a ton of books and Mm -hmm. I watch a lot of TV for a woman with my education level and my, um, how do I put this, my metropolitan haughtiness. Okay. <laughs> I love television. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I find this really relaxing for me. I can watch 30 minutes of something really silly from Comedy Central on Netflix. And I'm like, okay, like, I was able to kind of get out of my head during this time. And yes, I speak French, but I can also love Quolto reruns. Sure. Like, <laughs> It's about figuring out what's most restorative for you at that juncture in time. Mm -hmm. No, that totally makes sense. I'm sure it's different for everyone. Well, so if we think that we might have OCD or we feel like our stress or anxiety are really, you know, at levels that are a bit too high to handle maybe on our own, what are your suggestions on where to turn to help, like turn for help? I mean, what should we be doing? So, uh, self-promotion alert, I would recommend checking out my website, Mm glowingocdbrain.com. I have a section called OCD 101, where I go over a lot of the thought patterns and a lot of the symptoms that people with OCD struggle with. Mm -hmm. Um, I would also recommend checking out the book Brain Lock. It was written in the 1990s by a UCLA clinical psychiatrist named Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz. Okay. And he's arguably um, the reigning expert on OCD today. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, his son, Clint Fame, is he coached Leonardo DiCaprio uh, when he was in the movie The Aviator about how to portray Howard Hughes's raging OCD symptoms. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And Leonardo DiCaprio actually has OCD. Um, He was petrified as a young adult that he would step on a crack and break his mother's back. Okay. He would (laughs) jump over the cracks in the sidewalk. And if he stepped on a crack, he would have to start over again. Oh, wow. There's um, there's a number of celebrities that have OCD. Um, Justin Timberlake is one. He doesn't get into specifics. But I once read a funny quote by him. He said, I have OCD and ADD. You try living with that combination. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like having a brain full of confetti while also feeling like doom is impending. Right, sure. Well, so do you also recommend that people reach out to like a psychologist or a psychiatrist? Like, where does that kind of factor in? So I'm very biased 
in the sense that I had an enormously difficult time finding the right treatment for OCD. Okay. And it really came from, I went to like an intensive outpatient program that advertised itself as, you know, a, a lower grade alternative to an inpatient program. Mm-hmm. But we didn't cover the specifics of OCD at all in any of the classes or workshops. And when I was discharged, I went to a number of different clinicians who had familiarity with OCD, but they weren't conversant in the paradoxical way that OCD is treated. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when you have OCD, it's really a waste of time to try to analyze why am I feeling this way? You know, what in my childhood triggered me to feel this way? Um, What mental talk can I do to stop feeling this way? It's not about how you feel. It's about how you think and what action you can take. Mm -hmm. Um, A good example is like when I leave my apartment, like I always kind of wonder like, did I really lock the door? And it doesn't matter if I have a little bit of, like a butterfly feeling in my stomach. Like, I know I locked the door. I got to keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a lot of therapists have this instinct to troubleshoot the feeling. When when you have OCD, your error and danger detection center in your brain, called the amygdala, Mm -hmm. misfires like a mischievous kid pulling the fire alarm. Sure. Like, there is no reason to panic when you feel straight up panic and impending doom. Mm-hmm. And you need to learn to ignore those feelings and keep living your life. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the biggest issue where there's not enough knowledge of what OCD really is. Is that even if you're Khloe Kardashian and you feel like your shoes have to be arranged just so... I don't know if she really does have OCD or she falls somewhere on the OCD spectrum, Mm -hmm. but say she were me or someone else, like it's a chemical message in your brain that is saying something is wrong. You need to take action. Your red shoe is matched with your black shoe. Mm -hmm. And it feels as real as I just got in a car accident or my boyfriend is mad at me. When it's not, it's just an erroneous brain message. Sure, sure. That makes a lot of sense. That makes sense. Well, you mentioned it before, but can you repeat it just in case we didn't get it? What is your website? Where can we go to learn more about you? Uh, My website is glowingocdbrain.com. Perfect. And I believe you're you're also on Twitter. Is that right? I am. I'm a little bit addicted to Twitter. Okay. My handle is at Liz Funk. Um, so it's Liz and then funk, like the music. Great, great, great. <laughs> it's a fun life. That's perfect. That's perfect. Well, Liz, thank you for joining me. This has been great. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And thank you to those who sent me questions. You can send me your questions to Angela at CopelandCoaching.com. You can also send me your questions via Twitter. I'm at Copeland Coach. And on Facebook, I'm Copeland Coaching. Don't forget to help me out, subscribe on iTunes, and leave me a review. Thank you for listening to the Copeland Coaching Podcast today with your host, Angela Copeland. Tune in next time to get more great tips on turning your job search into a slam dunk.